We'll start with the first one, which is the uh, blower wheel condition. And let's talk, we'll talk about condenser fan blade condition too. Whenever you're replacing a motor, before you even start to pull that thing apart, before you even quote the motor, you need to look at the condition of the blade, whether that blade is a, you know, a, condenser fan, a condenser fan, condensal, that's not a word, a condenser fan blade or a blower wheel. Look at the condition of that. Because in a lot of cases, um, we're replacing, you know, a real common one would be, you go out, it's making a noise, you think it's bearings, you replace the motor and it ends up being the wheel. Especially when you have that case where the, um, where the hub is spinning, so the welds have come loose on the hub, and so it's hard, you know, you, you grab the blower wheel and you're like, well, there's nothing, I don't see anything wrong with it. And what I see a lot of technicians do is they'll take a motor, because they're not used to checking for play and bearings, which is why, coincidentally, when you're doing maintenances, it's a good thing to do. Not that you're going to replace motors generally on a maintenance because you feel play in the bearing, but getting used to what is normal and what is not normal. Because if you take a shaft on a motor and you push it in and out, you'll notice that that's normal for them to have some play in and out. But what you don't want is what you call end play, which is the, it shouldn't do like this. It shouldn't, it shouldn't wiggle if you push up and down or side to side with it. Now again, are there cases where you'll get a little bit? Sure, depends on the motor, that's why I say. So doing that regularly will give you a sense of what's acceptable and unacceptable. But I've seen a lot of technicians, they have a weird noise, and so they're like, well, I don't know, what is it? They look at the blower wheel, they don't notice anything, or even the condenser fan blade, same thing can happen there too. They don't notice anything immediately, and then they go and they push the shaft in and out, and they see that, that normal play that you get on a motor, and they say, well, that's the motor, they put the new motor in, and it does the same thing, because that, wheel or blade is spinning on the hub. So that's something to watch for. Hold the hub still and see if you get, if it, if it actually spins, and that will be a heck of a loud noise sometimes. So watch for that. So condition, obviously, dirty, damaged, those are fairly obvious, bent up. And if just paying attention to that alone will result in sometimes you being able to go ahead and quote the, the motor and the blade because there are cases where you have issues with both. So even if you have a burned up motor, look at the blade, look at the wheel. So if it needs to be replaced, go ahead and quote it all up, all up front because it'll make it a lot easier for that conversation with the customer, right? But all, also, if it's just dirty, sometimes you can clean it. It's also good that you look at, um, is this wheel gonna come off easy? If it looks like it's a absolute rusted ball of rust, it's a good idea to up front tell the customer, I'm going to try to get this off, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to or not. And so that way you've prepped that conversation. It just, it's always good to prep those conversations. And especially if it's a case where you've got to get a factory motor, you don't have a truck stock motor, just go ahead and get the wheel in most cases. Go ahead and get the blade. Um, at that point, you're not going to have the issue because a wheel and a blade are not generally that expensive and it's going to make the job that much easier to do. So end of the day, it's not going to cost the customer much more at that point anyway. And then you're not going to have to wrestle this thing apart. Uh, on the topic of blades, this is something that comes up because um, there are cases where maybe somebody did a maintenance and they weren't careful with the top and, they, and now you have a, a, a condenser fan that's out of balance. That can easily damage the motor, right? So if you ever put a blade back in after you replace a motor or you walk up to a unit that's got a lot of balance in the blade, does, do you guys know what to do in order to try to balance that blade? You know the first thing you do. Anybody? Flip it upside down. Take a tape measure. Measure the leading and trailing edges of each blade. And often what you'll find is, and a lot of times you can just see it. A lot of times you don't even need the tape measure. But a lot of times what you'll find is, is that one of them is bent out. So it's not the same distance from the top. Do you all understand what I'm saying? Flip that top over, leading and trailing edge of each one. A lot of times you can make an adjustment because the reason why it's out of balance is somebody took one of those blades and you know, kind of when they laid it down, it, it bent the blade a little bit. Again, if you can just see it, well then just, just bend it back. I mean, obviously if it's damaged, you're gonna have to replace it, but there's a lot of cases that I've been able to do that. Another thing is when you're replacing a condenser fan motor specifically, we're gonna kind of jump around here. I'm just hitting some high points here just to make sure we're all on the same page. When you replace a condenser fan motor specifically, we're generally installing them in a motor down configuration. Right, so shaft blade, or uh, shaft blade, shaft, motor shaft is down. And so in that application, you have to remove the weep plugs from the bottom of that fan motor. 
So I'm gonna say that slowly and once again, just to make sure that everybody heard that. You have to remove the weep plugs from the bottom of that motor. If you've ever seen, they've got those little rubber plugs or plastic plugs. Those have to come out. Do you know why? Condensation can drain out of that motor. Because otherwise, condensation can build up and they'll be ruined very quickly. If anybody's found one, you go out, especially in Florida, where condensation is such a huge issue. Some people in markets like Arizona you know, arid California might say, well, heck, I never even knew that and it was never a problem. Yeah, because you probably don't have the issues with condensation, but here we do. So you pull those out that way, they can, they're literally weep holes for, for crying out the condensation. They're not oil ports. Older mo motors, and there still are some out there, have oil ports and those are generally on the sides of the motor. And so those you pull out, you use your spout oil or you oil and then you put the plugs back in. But the ones that are on the bottom, and again, they generally have them on bottom and top. So if they're horizontal application, you pull both. If they're upside down, you pull the one at the bell end. But basically, it's the downside that you're pulling the plugs on. So that way, that condensation can drain out. Does that make sense? Even if you've never seen it before, some of you, you know, doing install or install apprentices, you may not have seen this. Just look for it when the time comes because it's one of those really obvious mistakes that people can make. Motor rotation, Max mentioned that. One thing that I see happen sometimes, um, I may have done it at one point in time, is people will wire the motor wrong and then they'll switch the motor direction by using the rotation. And in some cases the motor will work fine, in some cases it can damage the motor. It just depends on the motor. And so you have to pay attention, you know, you've got those rotational plugs. You have to pay attention to make sure that you wired it properly in the first place. That's, you know, just common sense. And it has to do with the differences in the start and run windings of those motors. So in some cases, you can get it to run the right direction, but it may not run right. So something to consider there. Pay attention to. Pay attention to. I just said the same thing twice for some reason. That needs an edit. I've been repeating myself a little bit lately. Happens as you get older. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, capacitor size. What size capacitor do you need to put in when you replace a fan motor the correct size so I, you hear a lot in the industry about um, you hear a lot in the industry about well you can put you know up to the next size up if it's all you've got no just put the right size capacitor on it not just because so even if because some guys will say well some guys will get really exotic with it well I put my redfish meter on it and I checked you know I checked power factor and it was closer to unity when it look if you put the wrong size capacitor on there, meaning the one that doesn't, that doesn't say on the motor, and the next guy goes out from a different company and sees that you put the wrong size in, you're gonna look like an idiot. So just put the size in that the motor says. Now, on the capacitors, just while we're on the note, it, you'll notice they'll generally say plus or minus 6% on the capacitor. That doesn't mean that they will always be plus or minus 6%. It just means that that is the allowable range when they're brand new. That's the brand new allowable range. That does not mean that if you go to one that's 6% out that you have to replace it, that it's failed. It just means that brand new, that's the range. Now, our standard, and we just made this up, is if it's outside of 10% low. Capacitors don't get higher capacitance as they age. So if you're reading a higher capacitance than the rating, check your tools because that pretty much doesn't happen. And some of you will say, well, I do the under load test and I'm super, super fancy and I know a lot of them read high. No, what's happening is, is you have an amp clamp that's picking up interference or it's re measuring high like some do. And when you do the calculation, it ends up calculating a higher number. But capacitors don't fail with high capacitance because what is a capacitor? It's a bunch of, it's a bunch of tin foil wrapped up in a steel can. I mean, it's, that's an oversimplification, obviously, but it's a you know, piece of mylar or plastic type material with a, with a metallic coating on either side. So it's not like somehow magically more metal can end up in that capacitor. What can happen is, is the metal breaks down, those metal plates degrade and the capacitance drops over time. So before you put a capacitor in, test it. Just use your bench test, you don't need to do anything fancy, just take your meter, test it, make sure that it's measuring within range before you install it. Just a good general practice. But put the right size capacitor with the motor and whenever you're replacing a motor, whenever you're replacing a compressor, um, anything that's a significant electrical change, just go ahead and put a new high quality capacitor in there. 
And the reason why I say high quality, you guys know we use the, the USA made capacitors. We don't necessarily always use the same brand, but we like Amrad. We like some of the, you know, the good quality brands. We just know from experience that they do better. They just last better. A lot of the factory capacitors are pretty poor quality. And so if we're going to put a motor in, we don't want to have the capacitor fail, you know, a week later, the customer blames us for that. So that's just our practice. All right. Anything come to mind as we're going through? Any other things come to mind as far as things that you think are really important when replacing motors? RPM. RPM. Amp draw. Amp draw. Let's start with RPM. RPM of the motor needs to match exactly with the caveat that not all motor manufacturers say the exact same nominal RPM. So a common one would be um, you know, 825 and 850. Th those are the same, 825 and 850 RPM. You can replace uh, those two with each other, all right? A 1075 or an 1100, it's the same. It's just a slight adjustment. So we'll say within 50 RPM out of the box. So you gotta match the RPM, you've gotta match the voltage. Those are the two that you absolutely have to match. Amperage, you want the motor to be in that same amperage range. If anything, you want it to be a little higher if, if, you, have, if you have to do something, so a little bit higher rating. But again, the higher the rating, the less efficient the motor's gonna run. And so that's giving somebody an impact on their sear rating. Horsepower, if you're gonna go anywhere with horsepower, you don't go down, you can go up a little bit as long as the physical size still matches. We've talked about this recently, but when you're looking at the physical size of the motor, if you take a motor that's this deep, okay, and you put in one that's this deep, what's the problem, potentially? Fan blade, right. If that fan blade goes deeper into the shroud, then it potentially won't move the air out the way it's supposed to. So, do not toy with factory fan blade depth initially. You can, in some cases, make slight adjustments to factory fan blades, slight, I'm talking about, and improve your condensing temperature. And that's how you do that, by the way. So if you want to get really, really fancy, you can look at what your condensing temperature is and make slight adjustments. Now the problem is, is it's sort of a moving target because outdoor temperatures change, conditions change. But if you suspect that, I, that that factory fan blade position isn't ideal, then what you do is you can make slight adjustments to it and then try to get your condensing temperature down, i.e. head pressure, right? Let's make it simple for the way some of us think of it. I say condensing temperature because that's a more holistic way of thinking about what you're doing. But if you make a slight adjustment and it brings your head pressure down, then that was a positive adjustment in almost every case. Now, there could be exceptions to every rule, but that would be a way that you would do that. But in general, when you walk up to something, and it's a factory blade, a factory motor, you want to make sure that that blade, height-wise, in that shroud remains the same height. But again, we don't always have the opportunity to walk up to a piece of equipment that was left the way the factory made it. Sometimes somebody else has been screwing around with it. And that's where you can look at, sometimes factory data will show you where the blade's supposed to go, sometimes it won't, and when it won't, make your best guess, and then you can make some adjustments based on uh, that condensing temperature and even the, even the current of the motor to some degree. Now, the, the topic of how uh, different fan blades and blower wheels, the amperage is affected by different static pressures or airflow rates, that's a fairly complicated topic, and we're not going to go into that too much. But just from a basic standpoint, on a condenser fan motor, when you have a restriction to air, you will see current go up. On a blower motor, when you have a restriction to air, you will see current go down, so long as it is a PSC motor, permanent split capacitor, or other standard induction type motor. If you go to something that's got a variable frequency drive on it or is a uh, uh, ECM type motor, electronically commutated motor, then in those cases you actually have logic in there that's compensating for that restriction and can result in higher current. So that was, for those of you who just were like newer and are like, I have no idea what he's talking about, just ignore that part that I just said. For those of you who have been around a while, that was for you. All right. But from a basic standpoint, we need to make sure that we're matching our horsepower as closely as possible. And if anything, a little higher horsepower, match your, your current. If anything, a little bit higher current, meaning that the motor is a, basically just means that the motor is a beefier motor. It's designed to handle more load, if anything. But in general, you match the motors. Now, controversial topic. Do we always have to replace motors with factory motors? Exact factory matches. Answer is no. There are people who will 
put in the comments of this video that that is absolute heresy. And I would love a world in which we could always put factory motors in. But again, like we talked about in the meeting earlier, we live in a world of getting our customers served, getting air conditioning and refrigeration to people. And so therefore we keep universal parts on our trucks. And so I don't have a problem using universal parts so long as that is the best option. There are times that it is not the best option. Cases like ECM motors, are there cases where even using, uh, what, 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 what the Gen Tech motors, what are those called again? The uh, Evergreen. Evergreen, are we still using Evergreen mostly? Or are we using the? No, Total Line. We're using the Total Line one. When you think about replacing a condensing fan motor and a regular induction PSC standard, what we see every day, condensing fan motor, it's a much more simple conversation across the board. Match the horsepower, amperage, definitely match your RPM, definitely match your voltage. That's the one that, that we see a lot on, blow, on the blower side is somebody puts 120 volt in a 240 and burns it up. That's, that's one that's happened a few, a few times. Um, so match those up, physical size, make sure it matches, make sure you pull the wheat plugs, make sure that you get the height in, make sure you get the rotation right. As far as wires go, we've had a lot of conversations about the right way of strapping wires. The main thing is, because you have those, those uh, reverse rotation wires that are meant to be right there. This is, you know, this thing in our industry, it's like, well, that's not the right way. Well, it's the way they come, right? I mean, like, we, it's not our responsibility. But what I would prefer you do, as it stands right now, is get the rotation right. So you can pull them up through the top just to make sure you have the rotation right. But once you have the rotation right, then put some heat shrink over them. We've got that kind of larger heat shrink. Just put a piece of that over it, melt it down, because that stuff will last. Electrical tape, other things, you know, the, the terminals will eventually, you know, we're in Florida, so everything breaks down in the sun. And then strap it underneath. I don't want to see wires sticking out the top of a condenser. There's been cases where cats have bit it and electrocuted themselves, or even kids could mess with it and hurt themselves. So we don't want wires sticking out the top. If you show up on one that's that way, heat shrink, strap it underneath with zip ties, a couple of them. Because the problem, of course, is still that the zip ties break down. I would rather, and we have them, I would rather you use tie wires. So those metal tie wires, and actually they're pretty simple. So if you, none of, if you don't have those, just grab a little bundle of them because then you can wrap those, twist those, and now that's not gonna break on you over time. I mean, I guess it still could potentially, but it's gonna be a lot less likely than your, than your typical zip tie. Again, that every company, so I'm looking at the camera here, every company is going to do this a little different, but I don't like having them hang out the top, and I definitely don't like just leaving them where they can easily flop into the, into the condenser fan blade. Does everybody kind of know what I'm talking about here? Okay. So in condenser fan mode, it's a pretty easy conversation. When you get to blowers, though, you've got to slow down. So don't just jam a, a, a aftermarket blower motor in where a factory motor was and be like, see ya because airflow is so critical. So don't just assume, oh, hey, they make the motor, so I just put it on high and move on, right? You've really got to make sure that that system is performing the way it's supposed to, which means that when you replace a blower, I'm being pretty realistic here, just knowing that when you get to this job and you got to replace a blower, some of you are going to feel a little overwhelmed. So slow down, read the manual, especially if you're doing an ECM retrofit, read the manual and do a measure quick report on it. And I know some of you are using MeasureQuick and sometimes your psychrometers, because again, MeasureQuick is very dependent on how well your psychrometers are working. And sometimes it's like, well, my numbers don't seem right. Take, take them and flop them, reassign them. Try to figure out which one of your probes is causing the trouble there. But regardless, I want you doing that so that way you can start to learn what low airflow looks like. And what does low airflow look like, by the way? What's the first thing you notice when you have low system airflow? Low superheat. On a fixed metering device, you may or may not see super low superheat on a TXV because that TXV is kind of backing it up, but you're going to see a combination of low superheat and low suction pressure. Those are things that you're going to notice. Like, hey, you know, when I do my 32 or 35 degrees below indoor ambient, that number is lower. My suction saturation number, my evaporator temperature number is lower than it should be. Not just, oh, well, I guess they run that way. You know, that's, don't walk away from that. There's this cult within our trade, especially of uh, fancy pants trainer types who say, you've got to measure your airflow on every job. Measure your airflow on every job. They say that. Does anybody know what they're talking about? Because I don't. I would like somebody to tell me how you measure your airflow on every job. 
What does that mean when somebody says measure your airflow, Sam? What does that mean to you? It's just temp split. That's all it is. Don't confuse. That's all you need. So obviously, we do a lot on airflow measurement. We talk about it a lot. And you can do things like using your static pressure probes and look at a fan chart, right? We've talked a lot about that. You can look at your, your charts based on static pressure. But that only applies to a factory motor in brand new condition. It doesn't apply once the blower wheel starts to get dirty, right? It doesn't apply once, even in some cases, once the evaporator coil gets dirty. Because and with us, we're, the evaporator coil is in the box, so we're measuring outside of the evaporator coil. So there's all these factors that play into that. So especially when you're doing an aftermarket motor, how do you confirm airflow exactly? Well, you could use a flow hood, but even then, you're measuring past the ductwork. You're not measuring right at the unit. So the answer, the real answer is, the only real way to measure total system airflow for a technician under normal conditions is to do a duct traverse with a hot wire anemometer or a rotating vane anemometer or use the true flow grid from the energy conservatory, which Max has one. So that's always a nice one. If you ever are really suspicious of a system in airflow, we can go take a look at that. Again, we don't do that all the time, but you can do that. But all, all of those tools require a significant amount of skill to use. You are not going to pull a true flow grid out of the box, hand it to one of these guys and be like, here, use this. It's obvious. It just gives you a read. No, it's not. It's like math and stuff. Same thing is true of a traverse. It's a skill that you have to use. It's a skill most of you, frankly, don't have. And even if you did have it, the accuracy of that measurement isn't that great. So there's all these hurdles. And I want you to all learn those things, but the reality is, is that ain't no regular residential service technician doing a duct traverse every time they go out. So anybody who's saying measure airflow every time, they're just talking. They don't really know what they're talking about. So what do we do? You can measure static pressure because that's still valuable, right? But also you look at your system performance carefully because a system that has low airflow will perform in a very specific way if that's the only problem, right? If you have a compound problem, that can get weird. But a system that's got low airflow, you're going to have low suction pressure, low superheat, again, depending on the valve, that can vary a little bit, and you're going to have a, a high split. You're going to have a high delta T, and even more so, you're going to have a high delta H, which means high enthalpy split. Those of you who are wearing my Secret Society hats, that's what those mean. Anybody seen the Secret Society hats? We've got a couple of them back here. I've changed the name to H Delta rather than Delta H. I think that sounds cooler. What do you guys think? H Delta or Delta H? Delta H. Delta H? Okay. Maybe. I haven't decided yet. And I, don't, and I haven't decided what our secret society is going to do yet, actually. <laughs> something secret. Exactly. Right. Something it secret. Like a cult right now. It is. No, yeah. It is. It is. Kalos already is like halfway. It is a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it is a little bit of a cult. I'll be real honest. All right. So that's what you do. And for those of you who are new to that, the way to do that is using MeasureQuake. Frankly, it's just the way to do that. And so when you are messing potentially with airflow, so you're replacing a blower motor, you're messing potentially with airflow. And you don't want too high of airflow either. Too high of airflow impacts what? Noise, Noise and humidity, yeah. The indoor airflow being too high impacts, you're not going to dehumidify as well, and potentially it's going to be noisy. And from a really simple standpoint, there's actually something too. You, I just replaced this blower, and now my return grill's whistling. You know, seriously though, because this is how, when especially when you're newer, and sometimes you know you might miss something, but then you catch yourself because right before you're about to leave, you notice, huh, that's different. Something's different here. Just being very practical about this, because this is this is the world that we live in. So I'm not saying don't measure airflow. I'm just saying it's a lot harder than you think it is. And from a practical standpoint, the best way that you're going to catch airflow problems is by being really practical about your system readings. And so when you're messing with a blower motor especially, pay attention to that. It's possible a thing could have the wrong wheel on it. Obviously, if the blower wheel is running backwards, you're, not, you're going to move very little air, and you're definitely going to have an airflow problem. And we've actually, in the past, here at Kalos, people have left blower wheels running backwards. And that's a obvious problem. Obviously, we didn't pay, either we didn't take our readings or we didn't pay attention to the numbers, which those two are the same thing, by the way. Some of us get feeling really good about ourselves because we're taking numbers, but if we don't know what they mean, then we might as well not be taking numbers, right? It's not that helpful. What about doing it the design temperature switch to find the delta T? So to try to figure out airflow. Uh, and how, do you, how would you do that? Okay. And then 
Okay, so you're saying, look, you're, okay, you're saying just do your standard delta T calculation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so your standard delta T calculation can be helpful, but the problem is, is that the, all of those charts that exist are based on 400 CFM per ton. We're at 350 CFM per ton, and also all of those charts that exist are based on a 12,000 uh, BTU per ton calculation. And do our pieces of equipment that we work on produce 12,000 BTUs per ton? Not always. It varies depending on um, operating conditions, and it depends depending on the particular piece of equipment. So that's the challenge with some of those charts. I'm not telling you don't use a delta T chart, because it's much better than saying, well, it should be 20 degrees. So it's more accurate than that, but it still doesn't tell the whole story. So delta T is definitely a moving target. Does everybody know what I mean by delta T? Difference between return temperature and supply temperature, that's all. So it's definitely a moving target. But what you're always gonna see is when you have low airflow, it's gonna be on the high side of that range. You know, if you're used to seeing, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, on that system that's got low airflow, you're gonna see 22, 23, 24, you know, Again, I know I'm being really uh, kind of loose with this, but other than doing a lot of really hard math or using MeasureQuick, it's going to be hard. MeasureQuick will give you that range of what your delta T should be based on more factors. Now, again, some of you are running into things where you're like, this doesn't seem right. If it doesn't seem right, then, then try to be thorough about it, especially as we get into this slower season. If you're finding things where MeasureQuick doesn't seem right, take some screenshots and even get on the phone with Jim or his team so that we can work out what the, what the problem is. Um, because a lot of times we're using it, it seems dead on and then sometimes we're getting weird measurements and I think it's probably the tools. It's probably the psychrometers. That's what I think it probably is, but it, takes, it would take a little bit of investigating to figure out what that is. So like anything else, you can only trust your tools so much because your tools can be wrong too. And when your tools seem wrong, the only thing we can do in the field is check them against other tools. That's the only tool we have in our toolbox, so to speak. So anyway, in terms of replacing motors, I wanted to get some of those things in place. Rotation, proper matchup, making sure you're pulling wheat plugs, making sure you're checking wheels and blades, making sure when you're running, even when you're routing wires that aren't your rotational wires, make sure that they're routed in a way that they're not gonna rub. Um, I've seen some pretty smart things that people have done. I think the one that I like best is, uh, if, your, if high voltage wires especially are in a location where they could potentially rub against the suction line or discharge line, now obviously if your condenser fan leads are rubbing against your suction line or your discharge line, you've probably got bigger problems. But when you are running wires through areas that they're really tough to get to, you can even take a, a small piece of Carflex and slit it and wrap that around it because Carflex is going to hold up better than some of the other options. In some cases we've used um, Armaflex, but even Armaflex over time, you know it tends to fall apart on you. On the topic of getting wheels and blades off, um, I see a lot of guys go to their puller too quick. Um, you all do need to have a puller. If you're a service tech, you need to have a puller. Um, it's a really inexpensive and good tool to have. And I think that everybody should have one. Travis is shaking his head at me. Um, but I do want you to not, to try to not use it before you use it. So. Easiest thing to do, you know, pull the, pull the set screw completely out of it, use your uh, PB blaster or whatever, let it sit, get it lubricated. Then what I suggest is if you can, move it a little further down because it's easier to get it to go down. Then you can sand it and clean it up a little bit more and then you can move it back up. And if possible, rotate it as you move it up. So put your uh, crescent wrench on the underside and you turn them opposite directions and then you'll often get them off. That's, again, blower wheel is more tough. So that's, but again, with the blower wheel, you have the advantage of a lot of times you can get, you know, you have the whole wheel and you've got the weight of that motor on the other side and, and you can usually kind of work it off that way. But get as much of the corrosion off as you can. Um, use your emery cloth, use your lubricating spray, whatever you've got. Um, and get it as clean as you can, even before, even if you do need to use the puller, I want you to have done all of that first, and if you use a puller, make sure that puller is centered on that shaft. Because that's what I see a lot of times, guys will tighten one of the set screws tighter than the other, and then it's, the puller's going in at an angle, and then they end up just destroying everything. So I don't like pullers. Um, Nathan, my brother, loves pullers, but he also loves using crescent wrenches as a hammer, so there's that. So anyway, I just again, a lot of just spend more time on prep. A lot of guys like to pull out the torch quickly. 
and especially once you've already used uh, you know, something like a lubricating oil or a PB blaster, that's a really bad idea. So I, I really don't think you generally need to pull the torch out for that sort of situation. Are there cases? Maybe, maybe, but that would be pretty rare. So do, do everything you can first, and then as your final, final step, if you don't have another choice, pull out a puller. And again, we're talking residential light commercial here. When you're in really big stuff, you're going to be using a whole different tool set. Ah, yes. So yes, you're on your puller, the actual uh, screws that hold your puller in place, don't put them in because they'll mar up the set screw. That's a good one. And also, only put your set screw in on the flat of the blade. So never tighten a set screw on the rounded part uh, of the blade, of the shaft is what I meant to say. Never tighten your set screw on the rounded part of the shaft ever. Even if you're, because some new blades will come with two set screws, and you might have a motor that only has one flat, what do you do? One flat. You only tighten on one flat. You just take the other one out. I don't care. Get it out of there. <laughs> so only tighten down set screws on the flat of the, of the shaft. Cool? Anything else? All right. It's going to be a busy one today. Got a couple, we got another couple hot weeks. Uh, thank you for how hard you work. Thank you for how seriously you take your jobs. I appreciate it every day. Why are you guys snorting? <laughs> I heard a couple snorts there. All right. Yeah. I just woke up there. Yeah. All right. Have a good one, guys.